We elect politicians so they can represent us, so they can govern us. Yet, opinion polls regularly show that we hold them in low regard. We are suspicious of their motives and often believe they are serving themselves rather than us. In this film, a journalist, an academic, and yes, a politician discuss what they think drives those who rule over us. Peter Hayes, former television political editor, last person to be handbagged by Maggie Thatcher. What do you think motivates politicians? Is it a desire to do good or is it self-interest? I would tend to the latter because it's mostly about their careers. Now they will tell you because you're young and impressionable. Yes, we wake up in the morning and we think, how can we save the world, or at least save my constituents, those few who voted for me? But actually, when you get them in the strangers' bar at two o'clock in the morning when they're drunk, then you find out what they're really like. And of course, most of them are only interested in their career. There are, of course, honourable exceptions. And indeed, many people start off wanting to do good, um, but the power goes to their heads, and certainly the money and the uh, expenses go to their heads. It is quite extraordinary how people can spend all their waking hours, and there have been a few, really helping people, but then fiddle their expenses. David Hine is a tutorial fellow in politics at the University of Oxford. There are a lot of different skills that go into politics, many of which not much to do with altruism, but have good consequences, uh, because you can't have politics without public support. And public support may not necessarily go to the good guy. <laughs> but nevertheless, somebody's got to have some public support in order to get policies through. I suspect that it's the case that a lot of the great people in life uh, that we think of as uh, very altruistic in public life and politics, and sometimes people who make great sacrifices, are people who fall into uh, politics, sometimes out of moral outrage, sometimes because they feel the situation is so needing of strong leadership that they've got to put themselves forward. And I think we often think that is the really altruistic form of political leader. One former MP says too many politicians have no link with the people they represent. The only seat I ever really wanted to, to, to represent was the seat in which I lived and the seat in which I, I, I was born, that was Hereford. The trend in British politics is to have what's called professional politicians. And these professional politicians are people who've been brought up in the political class. They've worked in the political establishment and they simply want to become an MP. And they don't really care where they represent. And I think that's a very, very damaging thing. We've always had that in politics in Britain. Um, Winston Churchill represented seats from Manchester to London, I think. Um, so we've always had it. What worries me is it seems to be becoming more and more the case. And I think that's something that is, is potentially very, very damaging to our system. This is Whitney, the parliamentary constituency for Prime Minister David Cameron. What do people here think? All the way, they're crooked, bent, and all out for themselves, yes. You probably get the odd genuine one, but they're all after something in the end, aren't they? So, yeah, yeah I, I think they're there to feather their own mess. I don't trust them. Do you think politicians are out for themselves? Yes. <laughs> and that's as somebody with a degree in politics and a master's, so, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're quite welcome. <laughs> um, when you leave university, you become a researcher, then you become a special advisor or SPAD as we call them and then you become an MP you have never had a proper job and that's what happens to quite a few of them and so they grow up in the party and um, when they get to Westminster they get ideas above their station but at the same time they realize they're just lobby fodder they can't actually do anything so you may be better off asking the question, why did they come into politics in the first place? What is it they thought they could do if they thought they were going to be doing good? And of course, most of them don't ask that question. They simply see it as a career. But what about the ones who 
have a job before and then end up going into politics because they see something wrong. Well, can you name me anyone of that ilk? I was hoping you might be able to do that. I can't. Um, normally people, uh, when they've done a job and they then become an MP, it's for a status thing. You know, they've got everything else, so why not get into the one club you can't buy your way into? Being an MP, your first and foremost role is to represent your constituency. And to do that properly, you need to live there, your family need to be there, you need to experience the situation that exists there. That gives you an opportunity to understand that area. Fine, go off and be a, a, a government minister or prime minister or whatever afterwards. But I think you do need to, to have that route. And I, and I find it very strange that um, members of parliament um, can suddenly arrive in constituencies, you know, two or three months before a general election or at a by-election or whatever, and suddenly claim that they can represent X constituency and yet have no real understanding. And, and, and certainly from my point of view, my first and foremost role in the 13 years I spent in Parliament was to represent the people of, of, of the Hereford constituency. And I hope I did that. Um, I loved being the, the Lib Dem Shadow Defence Secretary. I loved my time on the Foreign Affairs Committee. Of course, that's great. Those are additional parliamentary roles. But my principal role and the reason and the people that put me and gave me that opportunity to do those roles were the people that I lived with in the city of the county of Herefordshire. I think you can be a, a, a good, I think you can be an effective politician, <coughs> even if you have a very, very big ego. And really, if you're thinking constantly of your, of your, of your place in history, um, I still think you can be an effective politician. But I think it's also the case that we have expectations of standards. And I think it's also the case that if we're going to follow politicians, we have to be able to identify with them. And to some extent, we have to like them. Now, you can manufacture an image, uh, which is entirely false. The reality may be different. But if you're effective at doing that, um, you may get enough support to do the things that matter. And at one level, I'd say that is, that is being a good politician. We may subsequently discover, or we may discover along the road, but set those worries aside, that actually the person is not quite what they see. Of course, it is the strong leaders whose faces leap from the pages of history. We may look on them and be tempted to say, they don't make them like that anymore. But in the end, if we allow politicians to be less than they ought to be, if we fail to question their motives, we will always end up with the governments we deserve.